So good afternoon and welcome to Worcester Public Library's monthly nutrition class. These classes and our monthly cooking classes are funded with federal funds from the National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health through the University of Massachusetts Worcester. Today we welcome back registered dietitian Judy Palkin for her class, Fantastic Fiber. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much, Jen, and thanks to the Worcester Public Library. And thank you to those of you who are here. I know it's a really beautiful day out and I appreciate that you're here and I hope this will be helpful. I'm gonna share my screen now and show you some slides. Is that visible? Can, can yes. You see? Okay, so um, I'm talking to you from my home in Northborough and happy to share information with you about fantastic fiber. Um, I just want to share with you first that several years ago, I had the opportunity to work on a research study at the med school in Worcester, um, where we were trying to get people to eat a high fiber diet and looking at some metabolic effects. And my, my job for actually four years was teaching a series of high fiber classes to the study participants. And it was very important that they did it because this was research. And I was struck by how easy it was, um, not just for me to teach it how to get more fiber in, but for them to do it. Almost everybody succeeded and they did see beneficial health effects by doing it. So I don't want you to think of eating more fiber as a chore. Um, you might already be doing it. If you're trying to increase your fruit or vegetable intake or eat more whole grains, then you're already getting more fiber. And hopefully this will just help you along. So what I want to talk about is the health benefits of fiber, a couple different types of fiber, how much fiber should you be getting, and then finally getting your share of fiber in your diet. So I will show a few paintings as we go along. This is a beautiful Cezanne basket of apples from 1895. No one um, painted fruit, I think, like Cezanne. And he's got a lot of paintings like this with apples and other fruits spilling onto a table. And um, I think it's just beautiful. And indeed, apples are a source of fiber. So a medium apple has about 4.4 grams of fiber. And you might wonder, is that good? Should you be seeking out higher fiber foods? So to put it in perspective, um, and I'm not going to, you know, bombard you with a whole bunch of numbers, but I just want to put it in perspective. Um, a slice of whole wheat bread often has about two grams of fiber. When I look at the labels of them in stores, um, some of them have more for sure, like if they've added extra fiber to them. Um, and a, a half cup of garbanzo beans or chickpeas has about six grams of fiber. So that they're all good. We should get fiber from all different kinds of uh, plant foods, but yes, that apple is good. So what is fiber? Um, I'm, up at the top, I've got a definition from a really good research article in Lancet GI. Lancet is a really important British medical journal and they've got a GI version of it, gastrointestinal. And this is a recent article where they're talking about the benefits of fiber and they say, some confusion arises in the interpretation of data from dietary studies because fiber is not a specific molecule. Rather, fiber is a complex mixture of dietary residues, chiefly carbohydrates, that are not digested or absorbed by the human small intestine, but are used by the colonic microbiota and are associated with health benefits. So to break that down, what that means is Fiber isn't just one thing. It's many different substances, but they all have in common that they're not digested and absorbed in the human intestine. Um, it's not true of all creatures. Ruminants like cattle can digest and absorb a lot of things that we can't because they've got those, those extra stomachs that are filled with bacteria that break the grass down and everything. But um, for us, uh, fiber is the, the parts of plant cell walls that we cannot digest and absorb. And there's many different fibers. Some of them that you might have heard of are called cellulose, pectin, various gums, polydextrose, and there's many others. Most of them are carbohydrates. 
Um, and, and where it says they're used by the colonic microbiota, that's the beneficial microorganisms that live in our guts and they break down some of the fibers into healthy end products that have really good health benefits. So you will get fiber from fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, um, seaweed, and also mushrooms. And even though mushrooms, you know, we say fiber comes from plants and mushroom is a fungus, still we consider it to be those carbohydrates that we don't absorb in mushrooms, we consider them to be fiber as well. Fiber truly is fantastic. Um, there's almost no downside to it unless, you know, someone has a a gastrointestinal condition where they just cannot handle the fiber. For all the rest of us, fiber is truly fantastic. It reduces the risk and helps to treat many chronic illnesses. And I'm just gonna name a few of them. Fiber, getting a good amount of fiber in your diet can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And by that, I mean like heart attack and stroke. And if a person has cardiovascular disease, a high fiber diet should be part of the treatment. It's really important. Fiber can help to lower the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and the triglycerides, which are the fat in the bloodstream. When those are too high, that's a risk factor, just like cholesterol. Fiber can help to prevent and control diabetes. So um, this is a representation of the human gastrointestinal tract. So coming out of the stomach is this colorful part on the slide. That's the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine shown here in yellow is called the duodenum or sometimes pronounced duodenum. That's where sugar is absorbed. And you can think of starchy foods as being the same, like, like if it's white, like white bread or white pasta, breaks down into sugar really quickly. It's absorbed in that yellow part. And what fiber does is it can help to slow down the absorption of sugar from the gut into the bloodstream. And then in turn, we don't get those big spikes in blood sugar and insulin going up that's very bad for the pancreas and can lead to diabetes. So high fiber diet is so important. If you know that you have high blood sugars or someone in your family does, we also have a lot of diverticular disease in Western societies like ours. Um, so diverticulosis occurs mainly in the colon, the large intestine. And what happens is the inner layer um, straining too hard, it pushes through weak spots in the outer lining and these small outpouchings form in the wall of the large intestine. People have this and sometimes don't even know it. In fact, it's very common in Western populations. It's estimated that 10% of us over 40 have it, 50% of people over 60 have it, and almost all of us if we're over 80 have it. Um, so you might think it's just a part of aging, but it isn't. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. It's called diverticulitis when those outpouchings become inflamed and infected, and that can be very painful and very serious. So where fiber comes in is a high fiber diet helps to easily push the passage of waste through the colon and therefore people don't develop these outpouchings. Um, so a fiber rich diet can help to protect against this and be a treatment as well. Fiber can help to reduce the risk of colon cancer. We've known for quite a while that what's called insoluble fiber speeds up the transit time of food and waste. So in other words, it moves faster through the colon and therefore there's less time for cancer causing agents to be exposed to the wall of the colon. It's as simple as that. Um, so you can think of fiber as being nature's broom. It is called that. And I love that analogy to think of bits of fiber, you know, insoluble fiber, like wheat bran, for example, sweeping away the toxic compounds and getting them out faster. Now we also know that soluble fiber as well can reduce the risk of colon cancer. Um, constipation is a big 
problem in Western societies, just like diverticular disease is, a lot of visits to a lot of doctors are, are you know, taking place because of constipation. So I want to mention this handy prescription. If you or someone you love suffers from constipation, every day for a week, consume at least eight cups of water throughout the day, at least seven servings of fruits and vegetables, at least one serving of a really good whole grain. It could be oatmeal, wheatina, barley, whole wheat berries, brown rice, not a whole grain product like whole wheat bread, but something less processed where you can see the whole grain in your bowl. Um, and that's at least one serving, more is fine. And then on at least five of those days of the week, walk briskly or do some other form of aerobic activity for at least 30 minutes. Try this before buying fiber supplements. This is the natural way to deal with it. And then I also want to mention that eating a high fiber diet can help with weight control. Eating fiber helps us to feel full. It helps with satiety. So that might help us to eat less. You know this if you ever have a big bowl or just a good serving of a high fiber cereal at breakfast or you munch on some raw vegetables like broccoli or you have that apple. There are stretch receptors in the wall of our stomach and if we start filling it with high fiber food or water for that matter, those stretch receptors trigger the release of hormones that go up to the brain and tell the brain, I'm beginning to have enough. I can slow down on my eating. I can stop my eating. It's not 100% foolproof. I mean, we all know that we can out eat that feeling of, you know, of feeling satisfied, but it definitely can help. It's a strategy for people that are trying to lose some weight. So here's another uh, beautiful painting that I know I've shown in some of my classes before, a Matisse of apples on a table from 1916. Um, so again, apples are great for fiber. And I wanna remind you with all produce, it's really good to eat the peels. Um, the peels have a lot of fiber, not all of it, but they have a lot of fiber as well as vitamins, minerals, great phytochemicals that are just really good for health. Of course, you know, you do want to wash them really well. It's, it's a great idea to keep your fruit and veggie scrub brush right by your sink. Um, so many, many benefits to fiber, um, and I just want to give you a tiny bit of history about how we know this. It's very obvious to us. I'm sure you've all heard that fiber is good, and it was kind of intuitively obvious to our grandparents, who, who also kind of knew that fiber was good. But this man, Dennis Burkett, gets a lot of the credit for doing the research and the observations that tell us why fiber is so good. He was a doctor, a surgeon, um, and also a man of great creativity and curiosity. He was British, and he lived from 1911 to 1993. And he developed what's called the fiber hypothesis. He and some other researchers, but he was, I believe, the main one. He spent 20 years in Africa. He's also responsible for discovering Burkitt's lymphoma, if you've ever heard of that. Anyway, in the late 60s and early 70s in Africa, he observed several things over a period of years. He observed that rural Africans, like in Kenya and Uganda, ate a much higher fiber diet than anything he had ever observed in England. He also observed that there was no constipation. And to hear him tell it, to hear the story, um, is that everybody in England, in fact, Western societies in general, was suffering from constipation. And it is a big problem still to this day. Um, but not only that, and you know, sorry, to, this gets a little graphic, but he noticed that the stools were a lot bigger and just no problem passing them. He also noticed that he didn't see the diseases that he typically treated in England um, and that you would also see here. He didn't see a lot of cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, type two diabetes, colon cancer, certain gastrointestinal conditions like um, diverticular disease, constipation, inflammatory bowel disease, even appendicitis. He just wasn't seeing these diseases. So he, he hypothesized 
that the diseases that we see in high income countries, Western countries, are due to the small amount of dietary fiber consumed. This was kind of a radical idea that you could take these diseases that are so different and even speculate that they have a common cause. No one had thought of that before, but um, the research since then bears it out. And there's no question that now we know that choosing a diet high in fiber can help to lower your risk of many serious chronic illnesses. One of the best things you can do. Um, so now I'm gonna switch gears. There are other health benefits to fiber, but there's so many and I wanna move on and just mention the types of fiber and then talk about how you can get more fiber in your diet. So fiber chemists have different ways of categorizing fiber. And one of the easiest and most useful ways, I think, is to talk about it as soluble and insoluble. And also I, I'm gonna say what those are and then I wanna also mention fermentable fiber. So if we say fiber is insoluble, it's just like the name implies, it does not absorb water. It passes through our intestines relatively unchanged. And a couple of the insoluble fibers that you might have heard of are cellulose, hemicellulose, lignans. These types of fiber help with normal bowel function, like helping to avoid constipation, and they can decrease the risk of colon cancer, as I mentioned. You will get these good insoluble fiber from whole wheat products, like whole wheat bread and whole wheat pasta, um, brown rice, lots of vegetables and fruits, in particular, um, the skins of some root vegetables like carrots, potatoes, parsnips, rutabaga, many nuts and seeds, and in particular, also flaxseed. So just to emphasize about the whole wheat products, here's a beautiful Van Gogh wheat field with corn flowers from 1890. So that beautiful wheat, um, with its rich golden color, that is a source of great insoluble fiber. Moving on to soluble fiber, just like the name implies, it's soluble. It absorbs water and it swells up and forms a gelatinous mass in our guts. You can just imagine it. And it, there's many different soluble fibers. Some of the ones that you may have heard of are inulin, Pectin, like pectin is, you know, for making jams and jellies, guar gum and other gums, beta glucans, glucomannan, psyllium. Inulin, by the way, that's not a typo. That's not to be confused with insulin. Inulin is the name of that type of fiber. And psyllium, um, we mainly find that in products like Metamucil. And I'll, I'm going to explain more about those a little bit later. Um, these Soluble fibers are, have fantastic metabolic health effects. They are the ones that help to lower the serum LDL cholesterol, and they improve glycemic or blood sugar control by slowing the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. So you get great soluble fiber from oatmeal and oat bran, beans, barley, apples, pears, figs, carrots, peas, flaxseed, and you may notice there's some overlap with this list and the insoluble fiber list. And that's because foods are complex and they can have both soluble and insoluble fiber. The ones on the top, the oatmeal, the beans, the barley, these are exceptionally good sources of soluble fiber. So, you know, in particular, if you're struggling with cholesterol or blood sugar, it's a really good idea to include those. And I'll, have, I'll say a little bit more about them as we go on. Sometimes you might hear or see on a food label that fibers are, are fermentable, and some of them are. And what that means is that they're digested by the gut bacteria. And we call those prebiotics. You might see like a yogurt or some other foods that say they've got prebiotics in them. That means they've got some of these fibers. Fermentable fibers are great. They, the, the bacteria in the gut metabolize them and they produce beneficial end products that help to suppress chronic inflammation in the body and may help to protect against colon cancer. It seems that they do. 
Um, a lot of the fermentable fibers are also soluble fibers. Um, and they're probably found in a ton more foods than these, but these are the ones that I'm aware of that have been studied that are really good sources of fermentable fiber. Include them often, the ones you like. Bananas, blueberries, leeks, onions, garlic. And you know, for anyone who likes to cook even a little, leeks and onions and garlic are great things to have stocked in your kitchen. Asparagus, artichokes, Jerusalem artichokes, which are not closely related to the globe artichoke, the, the green one that you might be familiar with. The Jerusalem artichoke shown pictured here on the right is a tuber, um, totally different and, and a nice thing to try. Um, spinach, oats, chia and flax seeds, legumes, these are all good sources of fermentable fibers. Um, so I mentioned when I was talking about the soluble fiber a couple slides ago, I mentioned inulin. Inulin is showing up in a lot of foods. Manufacturers are adding it to energy bars and smoothies and um, all kinds of foods, yogurts, um, various foods. And the main source of inulin is from the root of this plant, this pretty kind of weed-like purplish, bluish flower that you've probably passed when you take a walk. Um, this flower is called chicory, and the root is the main source of inulin that they are now adding to a lot of foods. This is not a bad thing. This is just, you know, a way of getting additional fiber. If you see inulin on the label, it's not a bad thing. It can be a good thing. So how much fiber do we need anyway? Um, Everyone agrees, everyone who's in healthcare would probably agree that our current intake is way too low. In the US, it averages about 15 grams per day for US adults. That is abysmal. It's way too low and it's just not enough and it's no wonder we have all these gastrointestinal ailments. What our Institute of Medicine recommends is that for men, they should get at least, or about, they say 38 grams of fiber per day, and it goes down as we get older, they say for over 50, at least 30. For women, 25 grams a day, and after 50, at least 21. So those are still too low, in my opinion. Burkett, back to Dennis Burkett, the British surgeon with the hypothesis, his original recommendation was that we should all get more than 50 grams of fiber per day. And he, what he observed in Africa was that they were getting on average at least 100 grams per day. So we know it can be done <laughs> by making good food choices. Um, and I agree, and a lot of healthcare experts agree that more is better and does lead to health benefits. If you think that your fiber intake is low, if you're suspecting it after this discussion, it's fine to go ahead and track it. You might wanna track it for a couple days. You can easily check the amount of fiber in food um, in two ways. You can read fiber, the grams of fiber on food labels. If you're buying a food in a package, it should be listed there under carbohydrates. And it's also pretty easy these days to look up foods online. You don't need a special app. You don't even need a special website. You just go to your Google box and you type in, or you know, whatever your search engine is and type in how much fiber is in a pear or whatever you're interested in. And the data that comes up is pretty good these days. It's, it's generally USDA food composition data, which is pretty accurate. So if you want to, if you feel like doing that, it'll give you an idea how much fiber you're getting. So now let's talk about getting your share of fiber and how you can get more if you need to. Okay, so first of all, just choose a lot of plant foods. As mentioned, fiber is found in plant foods. So if you make sure to eat a plant-based diet, heavily plant-based, it doesn't have to be 100% plant-based, you will probably get plenty of fiber. Um, it might be that you several times a week have a high fiber breakfast cereal. It might be that you munch on some raw veggies or you have that apple or you decide to add a salad to your dinner. Um, there's plenty of ways you can get more fiber by choosing plant foods. 
Judy, we have a question from of Philomena. Course. Sure. Hi, Philomena. Um, can you eat too much fiber? Is there a downside or a health risk? The only way that you can eat too much fiber is if you do it too abruptly. So if you, you know, if you have a healthy GI system, you don't have to worry about getting too much. But if you're currently eating on the low end of the spectrum and you increase it very abruptly, you might have some, some belly pain, some bloating, some gas. So it's important to increase it slowly. And, you know, I, I guess I should say it's possible to eat too much of anything, um, but I don't think I, I don't think we would do that with a normal diet. So I think that just heading in the direction of more fiber for most of us is the way we want to go. I hope that helps. Um, let me know if not. But I wanted to say that oatmeal indeed is a really good breakfast choice. Um, and if you find you need something to jazz it up and maybe you've already discovered lots of toppings to put on your oatmeal, but here's a couple suggestions that you can mix and match. Apples and cinnamon, bananas and walnuts, peanut butter and raspberries, yogurt. Some people put a dollop of yogurt um, on their oatmeal. Canned pumpkin, um, really nourishing and tastes good on oats. Um, and yes, you can put a little sweetener too if you like. I also want to mention that oats do not have to be sweet and they do not have to be just for breakfast. It's cultural. We've gotten used to thinking of oats as just a breakfast food or just something that we put into oatmeal cookies. But in fact, it's really just another whole grain and you can serve them in a savory way with lunch or dinner. Here's, this is from the Food Network and I've included the link. Um, so when you get the copy of the handouts, if anyone's interested, they have a whole bunch of savory oat recipes. Um, this is oats with spinach and peas and chives and Parmesan and mint. Just looks so good. And I've tried, I have an oat recipe that includes ground turkey and lots of peppers and um, tomato sauce and it's really good. Um, so again, not just for breakfast. We do have a question from Lester. Sure. Um, what do you think of sauerkraut? Um, so cabbage, yeah, cabbage is a really high fiber nutritious food. So therefore, yes, yes to sauerkraut, yes to the beneficial bacteria, the probiotics in it, and yes to the cabbage. It might be, you know, for someone who needs to be careful of their sodium intake, they're going to need to watch the portion if it's got a lot of salt in it. But sauerkraut's a good food. Great question. Um, barley, again, really good source of that soluble fiber. So if you like to make soup or any, you know, anything that you would throw a whole grain into, a stew or something, add barley. It's best, you're going to get more fiber if instead of buying the pearled barley that we usually see in the supermarkets, you can buy what's called hulled barley. And that just has the outer inedible hull taken off, but it still has most of the bran. Um, you, and you can find that, it is out there. But barley is wonderful. Not too many paintings of barley out there, but here's one. Ohara Kosan was a Japanese artist who painted in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is a songbird on a barley stalk. Okay, back to getting more fiber into your day. Snack on raw vegetables, no matter what else you snack on. Um, but be sure to include some raw vegetables. Um, they have that effect of feeling more filling because they're crunchy and raw. Um, they're nutrient rich. They're portable if you're going somewhere. They're just so easy. So it could be carrots, celery, cauliflower, peppers, whatever you like. Give artichokes a try. Um, I know I've mentioned this before, but just my favorite vegetable. And it turns out they are one of the highest fiber vegetables coming in at seven grams and one medium artichoke. And they're just so good. Choose lots of fruit. Um, all fruit is good. What I've got listed here are the highest fiber fruits. So raspberries, blackberries, pears, apples, and bananas all great for fiber. 
Oh, we have a question uh, from Philomena. Sure. What do you do with artichokes? How do you cook them? Okay, so I do some, I, well, first I wash them and I have them on a cutting board and I cut off the sharp tips that each leaf has. You just keep turning it and cutting off those little sh sharp tips. Then I kind of half submerge them in, them in a pot of water. So they're gonna do a combination of boiling, steaming. Um, and I bring that up to heat and I cook them. It generally takes about an hour for a good size artichoke for them to get soft enough. Um, and then, you know, just you take them and you scrape each individual leaf on your teeth and you get that delicious kind of artichoke. Um, th there's, you know, artichoke, I, I want to say meat, it's not meat, but the filling of the artichoke from each leaf comes off in your mouth and the heart, when you get to the inside, the heart, it's absolutely delicious. And there are plenty of other fancier ways to cook artichokes. Some people, you know, hollow them out and stuff them and I gather they can be grilled but a simple way is just to steam or boil it or some combination. Uh, Philomena wants to know, that sounds like a lot of work. Are they really that yummy? <laughs> yes, they really are. <laughs> Somebody back me up on this. They really are that yummy. It's, it's not that there's so much work as that they take a while to cook. So an artichoke is not something you're going to have raw in your fridge and decide five minutes later that you're going to eat it, unlike a carrot, for example. So an artichoke, you know, you do have to decide an hour ahead that you want to serve artichokes. Um, I mean, you can buy canned or jarred or artichoke hearts. Trader Joe's sells frozen artichoke hearts. But to cook the whole artichoke, you do need to know ahead. And in terms of the work of eating it, that actually is something I like about it. So much of our food goes down so easily and so fast. So I actually like foods that take some time to eat and you know we can have that pleasure prolonged, so to speak. If anybody else likes artichokes, let me know, type it in the chat box. Anyway, back to the high fiber fruits, the pears and the apples. Here's a Courbet, he was a, a French painter who was a realist and he did this still life of pears and apples in 1871. Um, and I just, I think uh, that the color, especially of the apples is just exquisite. And just to be different, Van Gogh, here's his basket of apples from 1887. So different from the previous painting. Um, I almost, if I didn't know, I might not have guessed they were apples, but Leave it to Van Gogh, and it's very beautiful in its own way. Okay, another fantastic source of fiber, possibly the best, is legumes. So like the can of beans shown. So there's many things you can add beans to. There's so many soups and casseroles you can make. Here's some ideas that I hope will get you thinking if you're not using a lot of beans. Maybe you saute some pinto beans with some onion and garlic, saute it in olive oil, and then you wrap it up in a, in a high fiber wrap or a, a tortilla and just bake it for a few minutes in an oven. Um, maybe put some cheese, some lettuce, some tomatoes, and you've made yourself burritos. Um, if you're cooking brown rice, and I hope you will, throw in some frozen peas. You'll add extra fiber and it makes it nice and colorful and nutritious. If lunch is coming and you have at least an hour, you can throw together a pot of lentil soup. Um, lentils, even though they're dried, they're so tiny, they cook quickly. Um, 40 minutes to an hour and your lentil soup is done. If you're using ground meat, you might wanna consider extending it with beans, like for example, black beans. And you can certainly buy the canned beans, like I've shown here, but it's really easy and economical to use dried beans. And I've included just a quick recipe. It does not have to be an overnight soaking affair. You can, you can bring them to a simmer, bring them to a boil, turn it down to a simmer and let them cook. Usually it's gonna be an hour and a half to two hours, maybe even longer depending on how soft you like your beans to be, but it's easy to do. Choose for your bread, it's best to choose whole grain bread. Um, 
Ideally, we find breads that are 100% whole grain. And I have to admit, the bread aisle is a frustrating place. There's so many breads, and I often feel frustrated by how few of them are truly whole grain and healthy. I don't know why that has to be. But if we buy them, they'll produce more of them. So look for 100% whole grain, or at least look for the first ingredient to be whole grain. Um, so like the first ingredient might say whole wheat flour. Um, it's also really nice if the bread doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. Um, I just don't want six grams of sugar lurking in my slice of bread. I'd rather have that as dessert later on and know that I'm eating dessert. So for myself, I like to look for breads that are no higher than two grams of sugar per slice. Well, I have a question, Judy. Sure. So I like English muffins. So I was buying the Thomas English muffins, 100% um, whole wheat. Yeah. Uh, but then I noticed they have sucralose in them. They do? They do. That's so surprising. There's, yes. no, there's no good reason for that. Okay. I didn't think so. And I, so I've been turned off from them and I, I've been trying to buy another um, you know, the store brand, 100% whole wheat or um, this other brand, but I just feel like they kind of snuck that in there. For yes, some they reason. did. And it, it, it enables them to show a low sugar content. I mean, I would argue that these breads don't need either. I don't think that most of us are looking to our bread for a sweet experience as much as just a carb experience. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'm going to look for that the next time I'm shopping. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're right. I would seek out a different brand. Yeah. Okay. We should also be aware, and here's again where it gets a little confusing, is that multigrain doesn't necessarily mean whole grain. So we'll see breads that say seven grain or 12 grain or even 21 grain bread, but there can still be a lot of white flour in there. So you have to read the ingredient list. You know, if you're trying to avoid white flour, you need to look at the ingredient list. A dark color in a bread also does not mean whole grain. Um, sometimes those sneaky devils in the food industry will sneak in some caramel coloring to make it look dark because we associate that with healthy bread. So again, you just need to look for the whole grain in the ingredient list. Let me give you a couple examples because there are some out there. I found this at Wegmans. It's Vermont Bread Company soft whole wheat bread, and it is 100% whole wheat, and it doesn't have a lot of sugar. Um, when I looked, it seems like they're always changing their breads, but the day I looked in the whole bread aisle of the sliced sandwich breads, this was the only one that met my criteria. Um, even better was this one at Trader Joe's, um, this sprouted wheat multigrain bread, tons of good ingredients in it, um, lots of, you know, whole wheat berries and flax and other good ingredients. It's not high in sugar. Um, I didn't try it plain. I only, you know, I only tried it toasted, but it was very good toasted. So I, I do recommend it. Moving on to brown rice. As I've mentioned, brown rice is really, it's a really helpful whole grain, whereas white rice is refined and has the bran and the germ removed. So it's nutritionally devoid. And the figures here show brown rice has much more fiber as well as other nutrients than white rice. Here are some of the reasons you might be thinking that you don't want brown rice. Um, it takes too long to cook. It's too hard and chewy. My family doesn't like it. And I've always served X with white rice. So let me, let me um, take these down one by one. Yes, it does take longer to cook. It takes about 40 minutes as opposed to 20 minutes for white rice. But all, all that means is you need to put it on earlier, plan ahead. You can cook a bunch of extra. It keeps for several days in the fridge and a long time in the freezer and you, you could freeze it cooked. You can also buy it parboiled. You know, you can buy instant brown rice if you want to. Some places even sell cooked frozen brown rice. So there's a lot of ways to get brown rice easily. Too hard and chewy, which often goes hand in hand with my family doesn't like it. It's all what we're used to. Our plant foods ideally should not be really soft and start, you know, like fluffy and go down really easily. Um, some of them should be hard and chewy and that includes whole grains. Um, they're healthier, they do take longer to eat. 
and a lot of this is just what you're used to and your families, you know, they get used to it too. Um, but I have had some moms tell me that their, their kids as well as spouse, what they've done is they, they've gotten them used to it by combining white rice with brown rice and over time having that be more and more brown rice. So that can be a strategy if you've got some picky eaters you're dealing with. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And you know, for I've always served X with white rice, again, it's just what we're used to. Almost any dish that would traditionally be served on top of or with white rice can be just as good, if not better, with brown rice. You do get very used to it. We have a question from Jean. Um, sure. Has there been some health concern about a toxin associated with brown rice? Is rinsing it recommended? Oh, yes. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Jean. Um, yeah, uh, there are some heavy metals that sometimes have been found in small amounts in brown rice. These are in the soil, unfortunately. My understanding is this is more in coming from the U.S. Southeast. So if you buy um, rice from California or an Asian variety of, of brown rice, it's not much of a concern. Um, I don't rinse my rice before I cook it. I'm gonna look into that one. And also, uh, you know, if you are concerned about that, this is a, a very legitimate and great reason to just mix it up and have other whole grains. You can have wheat berries, you can have oat groats, you can have amaranth. There's lots of great whole grains out there, so it doesn't always have to be rice anyway. Uh, the follow-up question there, there are so many types of rice, um, like basmati, et cetera. Which of these are considered brown rice? Any of them can be brown or white, because brown refers to whether or not that bran and the germ have been removed. So there's brown basmati rice, and there's white basmati rice, and there's brown jasmine rice, and white jasmine rice. So like, for example, at Trader Joe's, as well as Stop and Shop, you can buy brown basmati rice. If it doesn't say brown, it's not. Uh, another question, um, is quinoa a whole grain? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's a great one. It's a very tiny one, but it is a, it is a whole grain. Um, I've often wondered, why do we even have white rice? Why take this really nutritious food and kind of um, strip away the nutrients? So I did a little reading about it and um, what, what happens is, so brown rice, because it includes the bran and the germ, the oils can become rancid if they're not refrigerated, if it sits out for a long time, like with any whole grain. So I guess this was a problem in earlier centuries. And in the 1800s, particularly in Germany, they developed rice milling machines, just like we have, just like millers would mill wheat and remove the bran and the germ, they started doing that to rice. And what resulted was the white rice that is now ubiquitous, unfortunately, because you know a lot of us have refrigeration now. Um, but it, it was marketed, it was advertised back in the 1800s as being a superior food when nothing could be further than the truth. And this is actually, it's not really a bowl of white rice. It's a food model of a, a bowl of white rice so um, this is from, this is a different type of a work of art. This is from uh, the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, where there is an entire house from China that was disassembled and brought over um, many years ago. It's called the Yin Yu Tang Chinese house. And you can go there and you can tour the house. It's big and you know something like 40 family members lived in it at a time when it was in China. And one room that is very small is the kitchen. And I, I wish I had panned out more, but this is the cooking area. To the right, there's a wok that's actually built right into the cooking counter. And there's the bowl of white rice, which was, you know, was and is commonly used. It's a great, it's a great experience to see this house at the museum. And here's another Van Gogh of an old man putting dry rice on the hearth from 1881. So um, 
first of all, I love this because of all the, the kitchen implements it shows, the kettle and the pot and the hearth and everything. But also I'm, I'm looking at it and to me, it looks like he's putting a bag of rice right on the flame. I don't know how that would turn out, but he must, he must have known what he was doing. And I think it's a beautiful drawing. Okay, let's move on to pasta. Who doesn't love pasta, right? It's a good idea to choose whole grain pasta. And often when we think of whole grain pasta, we think of whole wheat pasta, which is good. But there's also pastas now made from brown rice, quinoa, corn, and other whole grains. Trader Joe's has a really nice brown rice quinoa pasta. I've seen many whole grain pastas at Shaw's. Um, and I will say that if you try one and you don't like it, like if you try a whole wheat pasta and you just think it's too tough or something, try a different brand. Brands vary quite a bit. If you happen to love a low fiber breakfast cereal, all is not lost with your breakfast. You can boost it by adding a higher fiber breakfast cereal so you can mix them, mix them and match them. Like you might take a great high fiber cereal like shredded wheat and add it to your other cereal. You could add nuts like almonds, pecans, walnuts, any kind of seeds, berries, banana slices, or just sprinkle some bran on it. And now I do want to mention bran in particular, because I do think that adding bran to our food is a, just a great way to get in extra fiber. It's so easy. Um, so what you do is you buy a box of bran, or sometimes it comes in a bag, and you can add it to cereal, yogurt, smoothies. If you're baking, you can stir some into the batter. If you're making a, a breading for something, you can mix it with hopefully whole wheat breadcrumbs and make a nice coating. And here's a bag of wheat bran just that I found at Wegmans. Um, great food, great high fiber thing to be adding, ingredient to be adding to your other dishes. If you buy oat bran, you'll get that great soluble fiber from oats and you can add it to all the same things you might add wheat bran to. Um, you can also prepare it as a hot cereal. If you heat it with water or milk, it becomes a hot cereal because it absorbs the fluid. And you can also mix it with other oats. You can mix it with your rolled oats or your steel cut oats. Here is um, Bob's Red Mill oat bran. Um, they call it oat bran hot cereal, but it is just oat bran in there. Again, great, easy thing to buy. Also use flax seed, use any kind of seeds. Seeds are nutritional powerhouses. But flaxseed, again, is a source of that insoluble and soluble fiber. Um, you can add it to smoothies and sprinkle it on yogurt or cottage cheese or cereal. Once you open it, you should keep it in the refrigerator or the freezer because it's got great beneficial oils that could go bad if it sat out for too long. And sometimes you'll hear the term functional fiber. It it's not a different kind of fiber. What it means is they've just isolated specific fibers from plants and then they add them to packaged foods. Um, and, they, and they do this bearing in mind that it has beneficial physiological effects. It's good for our health. So for example, the Activia yogurt, um, it says in somewhere here, it says it's good for gut health, it supports gut health. Well, it's got added inulin, that one from the chicory root. Um, Dreamfield's pasta has added inulin. In fact, both of these two energy bars have added inulin and perhaps other fibers. But so adding fiber to foods is, is a good idea. It's not a bad idea, but the final product is only going to be as good as the ingredients in there. So I just want you to compare these two bars. The fiber one bar, like a lot of fiber one foods, is really high in sugar. It's got nine grams of sugar um, and only two grams of protein. So it's like a candy bar that they've added some fiber to. The kind bar is quite a bit better. It, it's got five grams of sugar, so it's got practically half the sugar 
and six grams of protein, which is more substantial. So it's important to evaluate and read labels. Uh, Judy, we have a question about the flaxseed. Um, so Philomena sure. loves inner cereals. Yeah. And she's wondering if it should be grounded. Oh, great question. Um, let me go back to the flaxseed when we're talking about this. Um, I think it's great to have it ground. You can buy it ground or you can grind it yourself in like either a coffee bean grinder or just a blender, just using a really nice dry blender. Um, but I also think it's nice to use some of them whole. It gives a nice um, crunchy texture if you're you know, pouring some of it on cereal or something. I do both. Um, I buy it whole and then I've been grinding some of it and using it that way and using some of it whole. Do you get all of the nutrients when it's whole? You know, there's a chance you might miss out on some of them. If you don't chew it carefully, you know, it's possible that some of them will pass through you intact, but you will get a lot of nutrients. If your main concern, if you really want to make sure you get all the nutrients, then go the ground route. You will get more, you know, you'll be sure to get all the omega-3s and, you know, the bit of protein that's in there and the vitamins and everything. I, I just happen to like to use it both ways, but I, I see where, what you're getting at, Philomena, and if it's ground, you will be sure to get more. So, you know, back to the food industry, adding fibers to food, this is by no means any list that I expect you to read or memorize or anything, but this is just to show you, these are now the FDA approved fibers that can be added to foods. It's a long list. And in general, it is a good thing that they're adding fiber to food because as discussed, most people don't get enough. As you eat more foods with fiber, you don't want to have that gastrointestinal distress. Like if you rush it and just, you know, go from five grams a day to 50 grams a day, you're going to feel that. So you should increase them slowly. There's no rush. Um, gradually increase your high fiber foods, space them throughout the day. And very important, very important, be sure to drink plenty of water. Fiber cannot work its magic. Um, you can actually become overly constipated even if you increase your fiber, if you don't drink a lot of water. Fiber needs the water to do what it has to do. And that's a healthy habit anyway. So you want to get small amounts of fiber throughout the day, a few grams here, several grams there, it does add up. For people that absolutely cannot get enough fiber through diet, and there are some people for various reasons, many times it's elderly people, there are fiber supplements. These are some of the more common ones. So Metamucil and Consul both have psyllium husk in them, which is a great source of soluble fiber. It can help with lowering cholesterol, blood sugar, can help with constipation. And Benafiber and Citrusil are more mainly good for normal digestive function. So if you think you need a fiber supplement, you should probably talk to your doctor about it. You might want to try the dietary route first, but if you need one, you know, it's a thing to talk to your doctor about and discuss which is the best one. Um, conversely, if you've been on one of these forever and it's just part of your daily routine, it might be time to evaluate whether you really need it. Because now you know all these wonderful fiber containing foods, it might be that you could do all this with food. This, by the way, is a picture of the psyllium plant. It's actually called plantago, but it's commonly called psyllium. Um, so this is what's found in Metamucil and Consul. There's a, a husk that goes around the seed that's got this gelatinous fiber in it. And um, it's a weed-like plant, and there are no paintings of it that I could find. So. We've heard an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And actually, in my reading, I discovered that this was based on an earlier rhyme that somebody wrote in Wales in 1866. It was originally, eat an apple on going to bed and you'll keep the doctor from earning his bread. I just think it's so interesting that 
back then and probably before there was this sense that eating plant foods like apples was good. But I wanna ask, does an apple a day keep the doctor away? And for an answer, I wanna go with yes. You know, it, it doesn't have to be an apple, but if we're eating high fiber foods and it benefits our health, it may just help to keep the doctor away. We do have a question from Philomena. Sure. Um, is there a way to make psyllium husk taste good? Metamucil has a lot of sugar. My mom doesn't need the sugar. I, I believe there is an unsweetened Metamucil. Now, whether it's got non-nutritive sweeteners like sucralose added, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. You know what? I'm just gonna go back to that slide. I think it's, this is a fuzzy picture. I think the original Metamucil does not have sugar. Um, but if you, I'm pretty sure there's an unsweetened one. And yes, people do mix it into smoothies. You can whip it up in the blender with, um, you know, a bit of fruit and some water and make it taste better just by flavoring it that way. I hope that helps. So now what I wanna know is what is your plan? Do you, I at least want you to be thinking about, you know, how could you improve or increase the fiber in your diet? And if you want to jot it down, if anybody would like to share in the chat box, um, I know we'd love to hear it. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to, you know, say it yourself. It's totally acceptable. Let's see, um, oh, Philomena is thinking of buying bran and adding it to food. Great, that's just one of the best plans. Yep. Yes, that sounds, that sounds very doable. I was actually thinking of that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's so easy that it feels like a cheat. <laughs> um, and by the way, keep it when you buy it, whether you buy wheat bran or oat bran or both, keep them handy where you can see them and then you'll be sure to use them. Yeah. And for everyone, you know, just this might require some thought. You certainly think about it and just try to have a, a plan for an enjoyable plan, something that you might like for how you can increase your fiber intake. Um, Jean wants to know where she'll find out, uh, find the handouts and recipes. So I will um, email them to you after the class. Yeah. The, I, I create a PDF, a document with the slides and I send that to Jen and Jen sends it to all of you. Yeah. Okay, so just in case anybody's interested, these are some of the references I used, including that great Lancet article. It's the um, third one down. Yeah, the high fiber diet uh, revisited. Um, so Burkitt's hypothesis revisited was just a great article. One thing about reading these British articles is you get to see fiber spelled F-I-B-R-E. <laughs> I, I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> it's throwing yeah. me off. Yeah. So with that, I want to thank everyone very much for coming. I hope this was helpful. My next class is going to be on October 10th, and it's um, all those diets. I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, some of the trendy weight loss diets that are out there, and how can we evaluate them, and can we salvage anything from them? Uh, so I wanted to mention my cousin um, lost a lot of weight. And one of the things he did was he ate dried oatmeal and he then he would drink water. So he ate it uncooked and then he drank yeah. water. And, Is that and healthy? I don't think there's a problem with that. I, so I sometimes have sprinkled, in, in sprinkling things on like a bowl of yogurt, I've been known to take some dry oatmeal and put it on there. So are you saying like, would he eat a whole bowl of it uncooked? I think maybe like a half a cup, right? Which is like a serving, I think. Like it, well, yeah. that's what you make it. Yes. With a, with a cup of water generally on the stove top. Yes. So I think he would just kind of like graze on that in the morning, eat a bunch of, uh, eat that, and then like just kind of drink water and his stomach would feel full. I'm in awe. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's I, great. Yeah. He um, probably got that satiety effect of just feeling full from that. And if it made him happy to eat it that way, um, good. Some people don't like cooked oats. Some people, I have one lady 
that I was working with who just found it to be pasty and she really didn't like it no matter what she tried to put on it. Yeah. So sometimes uh, either eating it raw, I suppose, or undercooking it um, makes it a crunchier experience, which mm. some people are happier with, but good for your cousin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jean, Jean says that she puts it in her smoothies as well. Yeah. Um, which sounds yeah. good too. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And it probably thickens it a little bit, I would imagine. Because it is oats. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I've put um, three links in the chat. So the Nutrition and Healthy Cooking blog, um, which Dot and I put together here at Worcester Public Library, the program survey, and we love to hear your feedback. So do fill it out. And then a link to our um, adult classes and programs page. So if you haven't already registered for Judy's next program in October, you can go ahead and do that um, through that link as well. And any of our other programs that you might find interesting. So if, if nobody has any other questions, I think we should all go and enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Great you, Judy. Thank you. Bye-bye.